Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. This week on the Q&A podcast, a conversation with New Yorker staff writer Lawrence Wright. He's the Pulitzer Prize winning author of the 9-11 book, The Looming Tower. His new title is The Plague Year, America in the Time of COVID. It's a sweeping history of the year 2020, from the initial outbreak of the virus in China, to the Trump administration's response, to the groundbreaking development and rollout of vaccines, all wrapped up in a tumultuous U.S. election contest. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Lawrence Wright, before we dig into your latest book, The Plague Year, I wanted to get your thoughts on the situation in Afghanistan, following up on your Pulitzer Prize winning work on the looming tower, which set the stage for the 9-11 attacks. What were your thoughts as you saw the Taliban take control of that country after a 20 years war? Oh, just enormous sadness. Uh, I was in Kabul in Afghanistan in 2003. It was a period of hope. You know, there was a lot of building underway. People had a sense that it it turned a page. And it's just heartbreaking to see, you know, how that whole promise of Afghanistan has simply collapsed and into what we don't know. But I, I think it's an ominous opening to a new chapter. What do you think it means for U.S. security, American security? Well, al-Qaeda became really a very dangerous force once it had the opportunity to train. Uh, It had these training camps in Afghanistan, and that's where al-Qaeda became the uh, terrorist group that we really had to deal with. Uh, Before that, they were a nuisance, and once they had those training camps operating, uh, they really became a very potent force. And, of course, that's what everybody's worried about. Uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, the Taliban say they're not going to let that happen, but Al-Qaeda fighters are, you know, have been fighting with the Taliban. So they are essentially an integrated force, and uh, separating those two entities, I think, might be difficult. The last question I wanted to ask you about is that This September, the nation's marking the 20th anniversary of those attacks. And I'm wondering what your perspectives are with the the distance of time and some hindsight about uh, how this country has changed and how much safer Americans are as a result of the changes. Well, the country has profoundly changed. And I often worry about young people who don't know uh, the America uh, that preceded 9-11. You know, they don't have the sense of freedom and community and trust that was so shattered on that day and has persisted. The security state that we built to protect ourselves, and I'm not saying we didn't need to do that, but it's changed our country considerably. What I worry about mainly is that uh, young people won't know what America was like before 9-11. And it'll be very difficult to steer back to that uh, because we'll have forgotten the country we used to be. And of course, now we've added at least a year and a half so far of a pandemic into the mix, uh, affecting young people and all of us. And so let's turn to that in your new book on this called The Plague Year. What were you trying to capture with this book? Well, I was asked initially by the editor of The New Yorker, David Remnick, to, uh, you know, write about the pandemic. And it was sort of an open ended. uh, He called it the big dumb story uh, that uh, they hadn't done yet. And I was resistant at first. Uh, I'd already written a novel about a pandemic that came out in the middle of the pandemic. And um, but I started thinking about how this pandemic has touched everything in our lives there's there's nothing that's you know business culture government health and science you know family life school just you can't you can't name a, a facet of of our lives that hasn't been changed and so i began to think this is you know what else is more important to do and so I decided I would look at different institutions in American life and see how it's changed. And it was it was a challenging assignment, but uh, you know I thought that it was time to write something that was sweeping uh, and and examine how Americans have changed, not just the society, but 
ourselves, how, how this pandemic has affected each of us. Your book begins with the Chinese, and readers will find a, a scene that I found pretty dramatic, and that was a phone call the first week of January 2020 between then CDC Chief Dr. Robert Redfield and his Chinese counterpart, whose name is Dr. George Fu Gao. Uh, Dr. Fu Gao was in tears during that call and said, we're too late. This was the first week of January. Why was he saying that? What had happened before that led him to that conclusion? Well, the previous conversation that uh, Redford and, and Redfield and Gal had, uh, Gal denied that this was a transmissible disease between humans. And apparently he hadn't been brought up to date. Uh, and when he was, uh, he realized the scope of this and the, the level of contagiousness. Uh, what happened during that conversation is that Redfield asked Gao if he could send a CDC team of experts, uh, epidemiologists, virologists, microbiologists, to China to find out what's actually going on and to help out. And Gao said that he wasn't authorized to give him permission, but you know, seek it from the Chinese government. And Redfield did on a number of occasions, and the Chinese would never let the Americans or any other Western nation in to examine what was going on. And that was a huge mistake, uh, a, a huge loss, because had Americans or others been able in, to get into China, they would have found out that it was transmissible, but they would also have found out it's not at all the disease that they were expecting. It was a disease that transmitted through asymptomatic infection. In other words, people were sick, not knowing they were ill and passing it on to others. So it's, you know, more than half of the contagion was spread through people who had no symptoms whatsoever. It would have totally changed the approach that we had into combating this disease had we known that. I wanted to read a paragraph uh, from uh, your book to describe the Chinese approach to this at the beginning. The Chinese government, again, failed to warn the WHO or even its own people about the dangers of the new disease until the news was already out. Chinese authorities ordered unauthorized labs to stop testing samples from Wuhan and to destroy existing stock. These steps slowed the flow of information about the virus. They also impeded the science required to develop a reliable test. Chinese authorities continued to downplay the threat once they knew about it. They demanded that researchers stop publishing about the virus without government authorization and cease warning about the danger of the outbreak. When you when you read that, you think, why? Why would they take this approach to something that could be so deadly? Uh, look back at the 2002-2003 SARS outbreak, Susan. Uh, in that occasion, you know, SARS was far more contagious than uh, SARS-2, which is a disease that Cause the virus that causes COVID-19 disease. And yet when world health authorities went to China back then to find out what was going on, the Chinese reportedly hid the patients in ambulances and taxis until the health authorities were gone. They had a sense that they didn't want to be responsible, held responsible uh, for a worldwide pandemic. And by the time they did that, it was already spread to Singapore and Hong Kong and Toronto and San Francisco. And so it was an immense effort by public health and a lot of luck that allowed us to stop that first SARS contagion. But the international health regulations were rewritten because of the Chinese behavior then. And this was the first test of uh, China's transparency we're faced with a, a dramatic new outbreak and they totally failed the test uh you know had the chinese been more transparent from the beginning uh i think that we've been we would have had a much better chance of stopping the spread of this contagion at least mitigating it your conclusion is that their response is quote indicative of the enduring legacy of maoism if that is the case, how does the the world protect its public health going forward? This is a real question. You know, I, this is not just a health matter. It's a national security issue for every country. And, you know, we have to 
we have to have compliance with the international health regulations and just examine, you know, the many demands uh, by the United States and other nations uh, to be allowed to have an actual investigation of the origin of this virus. And, and China's totally shut that down. When Australia, for instance, made that uh, request, uh, the Chinese sanctioned the Australian government uh, just for making the request to actually send investigators into China to find out how this happened and you know, where this disease originated. President Trump was criticized for dubbing the virus the China virus. Uh, it, when, it, when you look at hindsight and what you learned about their approach to it, was he wrong? Well, I agree with the CDC's feeling that uh, we should not stigmatize countries uh, for the origin of viruses. You know, go back to 1918 uh, when there was the pandemic of flu called the Spanish flu. And really, Spain had nothing to do with the origin of that uh, influenza outbreak. It probably began at a military camp in Kansas. Uh, But it became the Spanish flu because uh, 1918 first world war there was censorship in so many other countries that in spain did not censor the newspapers so it got tagged with the blame and subsequently we've done you know the delta variant which uh, began in india is not the indian variant i th- i think it it's fair enough not to try to but in this case the stigma is in many cases warranted uh by the chinese behavior And, you know, so it's hard to reconcile these two things. I think there's no reason to try to stir up the geopolitical pot uh, for political gain. But on the other hand, China really needs to be responsible to the international community. Do you think the world will ever know the origin of COVID-19? Only there are two possibilities. One is uh, that there's a whistleblower in China that is willing to risk so much and explain what might have actually happened with the perhaps a lab leak uh, uh, from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, or this is actually found in nature. It's, you know, we've, we tracked down the origin in an animal, probably originating with a bat and then spreading into an intermediate animal like a pangolin or or, or, or a civet cat as SARS-1 did. Uh, if we find that to be the case, then, we'll, then we will know. But lacking that, I don't think we will ever know. Since one of your goals was to look at the institutions and how they serve the public, start with the WHO. How did it do its job? Well, let's be charitable with the WHO in the sense that it has no actual power. Uh, it is a supplicant. It is entirely dependent on the cooperation of its member countries for any kind of informational cooperation. It doesn't have teeth. And we don't have a World Health Organization that can actually impose uh, certain demands on member countries. And we should. I mean, it's a matter of universal safety. But, uh, you know, the WHO was incredibly compliant with Chinese demands. And uh, and I think that in many ways, the WHO served the needs of the Chinese authorities better than they did the world health, uh, the the health of the world. Uh, Going back to your description of the disease itself, uh, there was a phrase that stuck with me that it arrived on cat's paws. That goes to your description of the asymptomatic carriers. Uh, What did mistakes did the early researchers make, perhaps presumptions about covid that uh, led them in a direction that may have been off kilter from what we ultimately knew? Well, really the beginning was that this is the flu. This is just a, you know, a, a magnified flu, and it's not. It doesn't behave like the flu. It doesn't spread like the flu. And the symptoms are, you know, so myriad. Uh, you know, the flu, when you get sick, you, you know, you know you're, you've got the flu, you go to bed. Uh, And that actually reduces the transmission because people subtract themselves from society in order to get well. Here you had people who were, you know, raging with virus and didn't know it uh, and spreading it in that way. Uh, That something that took a long time for the American public health institutions to to figure out. And also, you know, there was a great deal of resistance to, for instance, wearing masks. Uh, 
with flu, it's not common in the U.S. to wear a mask. Uh, but with this particular virus, mask wearing turns out to be essential. Uh, you know, an example is Hong Kong, the densest city in the world, had a rather low outbreak of COVID-19 because of the habit of wearing masks during contagions. You uh, talk about three distinct opportunities to, that we would have had to curb the COVID contagion, and you've talked about one of them, the Chinese rejection of the request to visit Wuhan early January, the wearing of masks, and the third was reliable tests. Before we get to tests, I wanted to ask you about mask wearing. It's not just that it's not part of our culture. It's become a, a hot political yeah. subject. How did that happen? Well, I think you can lay the blame at the former president. Uh, Trump was um, invited by the COVID task force in the White House to brief the American people on the fact that mask wearing would help. In fact, it was about the only thing that we had left in our arsenal of tools to, to deal with the spread of a contagion. And so he went on television and he said, you know, apparently masks are working. I've been t advised and I'm told that you should wear it. Now, it's voluntary. I'm not going to wear a mask, but, you know, you might want to, but I'm not going to wear a mask. He subverted the message from the beginning and then re not only refused to wear a mask in public, he went to a mask making factory without a mask. I mean, the, what kind of message was he sending? Uh, it, was, it was subversion and contempt of the, the the last thing that we had that could have mitigated the spread of the contagion. Then move to the second point on reliable tests, especially with an asymptomatic disease and so many people, reliable tests were essential. How did that get off track at the beginning? Well, at the very beginning, uh, the Chinese refused to send a sample of the virus, which I, as far as I know, they have still never sent a sample of the original virus. And that's what you use to create a test. Uh, and it wasn't until January 20th, when the uh, end of 2020, when the first case was detected in Washington state that we had a sample of the virus. And that was the starting gun for the creating for the creation of a test kit uh, for the CDC to make to send out to the public health labs. Now, the CDC is the gold standard, has been uh, since its origin uh, for public health institutions all over the world and is renowned for creating such tests. If, it's heartbreaking to see that great institution so humbled, uh, but the test was this is, the, I guess, the hardest thing for me to understand. Before it left the doors of the CDC to go to public health uh, clinics around the country, the people who invented the test knew that it would fail at least 30 percent of the time. So it was unreliable from the get go. And they didn't tell anybody. It was public health labs that began testing it. As soon as they arrived, what you normally do with such a test is test it against something you know to be sterile, like you know water that is purified. And the water was turning out, turning up with COVID. Uh, so something was wrong. And so the CDC went back to work on it. And weeks passed. Uh, this, these were critical weeks when the virus was spreading all over America, but we had no way of determining it spread. We were blind because we didn't have the test. Finally, the FDA sent a, an emissary to Atlanta, and uh, he discovered immediately what was going on. The lab where they were making the test was also the same room where they were testing the swabs that were coming in from uh, hospitals and public health uh, agencies around the country. So it was a con simple contamination of, of the, vi the virus into the test. And, uh, it, you know, the solution was to send the production outside of the CDC, and that was done immediately, and, and the problem was solved. But all of February essentially was lost because we didn't have a test. So how did the yeah. CDC get to this point? When I was a young reporter, it was a, it was a great institution. One of the, I thought the finest example of government uh, that I'd ever seen. And the people that worked there were extraordinary. 
I've learned from interviewing people that, you know, perhaps some of the caliber of the scientists has diminished. Whether or not that's true, there was money at the CDC. They built onto their campus. Uh, but I think it was, it lost its way. Uh, it, it, it's been renowned recently for being really slow uh, to react. And, you know, in this case, speed was of the essence. And when they put the gas on and they came up with a faulty test, somehow they've just lost the spirit and perhaps the, the competence that they once had. Of course, uh, there is also a role for congressional oversight. And I wanted to turn to Congress for just a bit. Uh, you uh, write that the United States had judged itself as ready for a pandemic, and there had been exercises during the Obama administration. And in fact, in 2019, the Trump administration conducted an exercise called Crimson Contagion. Congress was briefed about this. How did they react? Well, the entire government did not react uh at all really uh to the threat of the pandemic we you know dr fauci predicted before the pandemic that a pandemic would hit during the trump administration so there were public health officials who n- knew and people i had talked to when i was working on my novel about a pandemic uh in the public health establishment it was widely feared that a pandemic would hit and that we would not be any more prepared than we had been in 1918. And yet over for years, you know, budgets have been cut in public health. Tens of thousands of jobs in public health around the country have been lost. Uh, So, you know, it's definitely, you know, the responsibility of the government in its entirety to support our public health institutions. But there was a kind of hubris that had spread throughout the country that, you know, infectious diseases, that the era of that age is over. And so I I suppose a complacency had taken place. Um, I wanted to say something about the Crimson Contagion. Uh, You know, the the Obama administration had passed off a playbook to the Trump administration about what to do in case of a pandemic. And the Trump administration threw it out. But their own exercise called the Crimson Contagion, which lasted for months, involving hospitals, uh, the CDC, uh, Health and Human Services, the Red Cross, you know, a vast array. They had a scenario, which was that a traveler returns home to Chicago with a dry cough and the next day his son goes to a rock concert and and six months later 586,000 Americans are dead pretty close to the actual number the scenario is creepily uh, reminiscent of what actually happened it was prescient and what did they learn in this contagion exercise they learned that states were ill-equipped to deal with it themselves, that government agencies didn't know who was in charge, that businesses were going to be struggling to figure out how to keep in business with their employees working at home, that the supply lines were going to be clogged up. And, you know, all of these things they knew in advance, and yet no actual lessons were learned. You also have a fact related to this that you said that the arrival, the first known arrival was on January 20th in Washington state. The first congressional briefing you report was just four days later, January 24th, and only 20 United States senators showed up. Yeah, it was not taken seriously. And, uh, you know, we were certainly asleep at the switch. So, yes, it it was an intelligence failure for what, you know, the you know, in the White House, there the daily briefing, there was very little about a pandemic. Uh, it was essentially not seen as a threat, despite the fact that by this time, China had begun to uh, close down cities and, and make sure people were all locked down. You know, eventually half a billion people were locked down. And yet for some reason, you know, especially at the highest tiers of power, uh, this disease was not taken seriously. And even public health people were uh, perhaps a little lax in um, sounding the alarm.
So let's um, move a little more deeply into the Trump administration. And one of the figures that readers will meet throughout your story is a a man by the name of Matthew Pottinger. Um, I have a video clip. I'm just going to put that on uh, right now so people can see what he looks like, see what he sounds like. This is from an appearance on Face the Nation on February February 21st of 2021. Let's watch. I had covered the the SARS epidemic back in 2003 when I was living in China, writing for the Wall Street Journal. So I dusted off some of my old contacts and uh, talked to Chinese doctors who had firsthand information about this pandemic, and they were very open. They said, yeah, this thing is not going to be like SARS 2003. It's going to be like the 1918 flu pandemic uh, because it's spreading silently. When you're talking about the Chinese Communist Party in a, in a uh, you know, in an authoritarian regime that cares about nothing other than its own survival, um, we were a little bit too credulous. We were, we were waiting to be fed information uh, when the nature of that regime uh, meant that we were not going to get that information. They, they had a strong incentive to mislead uh, their own public and the rest of the world uh, about the nature of this virus. And that's, wh- that's why we're paying the price that we've paid. Lawrence Wright, who was Matthew, who is Matthew Pottinger, and why was he so helpful in understanding the first COVID year? Well, Matt Pottinger is a unique figure, and um, it, what, he was a deputy national security advisor uh, in the Trump administration, responsible for Asia. Uh, he speaks fluent Mandarin, and as he mentioned in the clip, he covered the SARS outbreak in 2003 in China for the Wall Street Journal. And I'm kind of fond of that because (laughs) he acted as a reporter, Uh, you know, instead of relying on the intelligence community to produce briefs, he picked up the phone and called sources and got firsthand information about what was going on in China. This mysterious why it was so difficult for anyone else to try to get that kind of information. But he became the essential man in the Trump White House. It also is coincidental that his wife had been an immunologist at CDC and had created a, 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 an AIDS test. And, uh, and his brother is an epidemiologist at the University of Washington, where the first case was detected. So, you know, he had uh, tentacles out in uh, these communities that were perhaps unique but he exercised his own authority to call around and find out what's actually going on in China. And even public health people were ill-advised and ill-informed about what was happening in China until Pottinger uh, made them aware of what was actually happening there. What was his role inside the White House meetings? Well, he created the White House Coronavirus Task Force And uh, he brought in uh, representatives from different agencies and public health people. And so to get everybody in a room to try to coordinate, you know, our response. And it became the most, uh, you know, I mean, they met every day. They didn't meet every day for anything else. So there was a lot of seriousness put into that task force. And through that, Pottinger convinced them. Uh, to stop flights from China, for instance. China had pretty much shut down internal transportation, but flights to other countries they allowed. And, you know, tens of thousands of people were coming every month from China. Uh, So, you know, that was stopped. And eventually also uh, travel from Europe when uh, Italy became so besieged. Uh, And so that was Pottinger's effort. And he was also the one to, to for the first person to wear a mask in the White House. You, you say that Matt Pottinger credited President uh, Trump's decision to cut off flights, uh, China and ultimately Europe, as a bold stroke that may have saved up to a million people from dying. Uh, what are your thoughts about the president making that decision? What did you learn about what got him to the point to say yes to that ban? That was a hard decision. There's no question about it. Uh, Even people in the public health uh, community were mixed about it because one of the maxims of of public health is that uh, travel bans don't work. By the time you impose them, the the disease has already leaped over the borders. And also it might interfere with the transport of doctors and so on. Um, But in this case, with, you know, people, you know, the, the intensity of international travel has has changed so much that I don't think the you know, it was time for the public health community to reevaluate that. 
And it was Pottinger to, who was a solo voice at the beginning. And of course, people that were in the Secretary of Transportation, of, of, of the Secretary of the Treasury and the White House Chief of Staff were appalled at the possible economic cost of imposing these travel bans. Uh, so it was a struggle to, uh, to get them to face the fact that the disease was pouring across our borders. And, you know, you have to give credit to Pottinger uh, to, to bring that to the president's attention and then to actually have created an environment in which the public health people and eventually the Treasury Secretary would see the need to block these flights in order to slow the transmission. A White House meeting on March 11th was a critical one. Um, and uh, the president was told that it was going to be the biggest decision of his presidency. That's about uh, imposing a, a lockdown nationally. Set the scene yeah. for us about what happened and the debates that ensued. Well, you can imagine the different interests that were at the table, uh, you know, and, and we still see it play out. You know, there were the people that were advocating for the health of the, of the, of the nation. And, and there were people that were advocating for the economic health of the nation. Uh, and they saw themselves as being an irreversible, and they saw themselves being irretrievably at odds. And it, it really became a question for the president to make a decision about whether to lock down the country uh, and take the economic hit that his Treasury Secretary and others were suggesting would happen. And, you know, he did. Uh, there was a, a, a lockdown, uh, maybe too ambitious to call it a lockdown, but there was a crackdown on, uh, on social behavior in the U.S., that made it probably a real difference at the time. You remember this was March when the first wave was beginning to crest and people were finally beginning to realize uh, the, the degree of damage that this disease was causing, not just to people's health, but also to our economy. And after that, the wave began to subside. Let's listen to President Trump on the night of March 11th from the address to the nation uh, announcing uh, that the uh, lockdown would, would ensue. I will never hesitate to take any necessary steps to protect the lives, health and safety of the American people. I will always put the well-being of America first. If we are vigilant and we can reduce the chance of infection, which we will, we will significantly impede the transmission of the virus. The, the virus will not have a chance against us. No nation is more prepared or more resilient than the United States. We have the best economy, the most advanced health care, and the most talented doctors, scientists, and researchers anywhere in the world. Our future remains brighter than anyone can imagine. Acting with compassion and love, we will heal the sick, care for those in need, help our fellow citizens, and emerge from this challenge stronger and more unified than ever before. Well, listening to President Trump in March of 2020, uh, how do those comments compare with uh, the way he presented the virus to the public as the year unfolded? Well, you know, it, had he been the president uh, that he said he was in that speech, uh, then the nation would have had an entirely different experience with COVID-19. Uh, right after that speech, uh, he had a call with the governors of the 50 states. And he said, you know, we're behind you. And then he explained what that meant. He said, we're behind you uh, in terms of support. But you know, in terms of PPE and ventilators and stuff like that, get it yourselves. It's much easier that way. And at that moment, the governors realized they were on their own. There was no federal plan that was going to come in and help them. Uh, there were federal plans, but they weren't going to be implemented. And they were, at that point, uh, you know, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, told me that she realized that in some hospitals in Detroit, they were out of PPE already. I mean, it wasn't a matter of weeks or months where they might run out. They were out. And governors began to call China, you know, asking, you know, trying to buy uh, ventilators and, 
and masks and gloves and gowns and syringes and all the stuff they expected that would be coming from the federal government. And they were, you know, you know, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, say it was like be on eBay. He would he would put in an order for masks and then you find out that California had outbid him. Uh, Charlie Baker, the governor of Massachusetts, had ordered three million masks from China. And when it came into the port of, of New York, the feds confiscated it. And the next time he sent the New England Patriots team plane to China, and then when it returned to Logan Airport, they hid the PPE from the federal government. This was common. This is how governors had to deal with something they never expected they would have to handle themselves. So the, it was, the, the federal government essentially abandoned uh, the authority to handle this pandemic and left it in the hands of 50 unprepared governors. When there is a, uh, a, a huge event like a hurricane uh, or wildfires, the federal government marshals its resources across state lines to assist. Yeah. What happened here that such a different approach was taken? Uh, I think there was a reluctance to exercise, you know, the authorities of the government. Uh, there is a national stockpile of, you know, a, a PPE and ventilators and so on. It was very depleted and it wasn't just Trump's fault. I mean, it had been depleted since, well, there was a, a, a flu uh, epidemic during the Obama administration and uh, it had never been replenished. Um, so, you know, the, yes, the supplies were diminished. Uh, the There were political uh, shenanigans going on inside the, the Trump administration that took precedence over the health. For instance, uh, in the HHS, their chief spokesperson uh, took snatched three million dollars out of the CDC budget to try to create a, a, an ad campaign using celebrities to support the president in his efforts to uh, uh, to combat the virus. And uh, and that actually never happened. Uh, you know, the ad campaign never came along because he couldn't find the celebrities that, that, would, that were Trump supporters uh, who were willing or credible enough to, to be a part of the ad. But that's the kind of, you know, it was undermining the authority of the CDC and, you know, infighting between the FDA and the CDC and the HHS. The, the government was at odds with itself and all tangled up and unable and unwilling to, uh, to do the kinds of things that actually would be called government. How did the vaccine story become such a success one then? I have to give Trump credit for this. Uh, he approved Operation Warp Speed, and it was unprecedented. And essentially, the basic fact of Operation Warp Speed is that the government guaranteed pharmaceutical companies that they would be reimbursed for their expenses in developing a vaccine, even if it didn't work or was never used. And, you know, based on that, uh, pharmaceutical companies, notably Pfizer, dived in and Moderna, uh, you know, was already on board. Uh, so, you know, if, if the government hadn't underwritten uh, the development of the vaccines at the scale that they did, knowing that there would be vaccines that didn't work and would be never used, we wouldn't we would be in a far, far worse situation uh, at the time. Uh, it was predicted that we wouldn't have a credible, useful vaccine until the fall of this year. And just imagine what that would be like with the Delta variant raging around and no vaccine to stand in its way. Two doctors on the vaccine story that you describe as heroes are Barney Graham and Jason McClellan. Why are they heroes in this story? Well, we owe them so much. Barney Graham, six foot five farm boy from Kansas, uh, had been working for years on uh, trying to create a vaccine for RSV, which is a disease that mainly affects infants. And he was struggling until Jason McClellan came into his lab, which is at the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, which is Dr. Fauci's shop. And Jason is a, a, a structural biologist, which is a relatively new field of biology. 
uh, where you use incredibly advanced imagery uh, to actually see, you know, the virus particles. And so using those techniques, they were working on RSV and they also began to work on coronaviruses, SARS and MERS and other coronaviruses to see if they could develop a prospective vaccine for those diseases. So they had a head start. And when they finally got the, the genetic sequence in January of 2020, it took them only two days to create the, vi- the vaccine. And they sent it to Moderna and six weeks later, human trials are underway. There's never been a vaccine developed so quickly and rarely one as effective as the one that is now in both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. How did the FDA perform in the vaccine development? I think the FDA slowed things down. Uh, in, as you see, we still haven't uh, had full approval of the vaccine, uh, even though millions of people have taken it and they've been, it's been an extraordinarily safe and effective vaccine. Uh, so the FDA uh, also slowed things down with uh, uh, the testing. Uh, so I, I can't say that the FDA or the CDC uh, or HHS, any of the agencies that are primarily devoted to public health in the United States, performed well during this experience. When the history books are written, how will Dr. Anthony Fauci appear? Well, he's an unusual person. You know, the, uh, it's good that there is a, a figure that uh, is widely trusted uh, in concerns with public health, in which he still is. Uh, he was not always right. He was slow on um, the use of masks, uh, and he may have given some mixed messages. But Dr. Fauci is a scientist, and that's what I think, uh, with all the criticism of him, people are criticizing him for not being right about things he couldn't have known. Uh, we didn't know at the beginning that this was asymptomatically transmissible. And uh, you would have to be a prophet to know uh, some of the things that he's being criticized for. And when he learned differently, he changed his prescription. And that's what science does. And every scientist working on COVID-19 has had to struggle with the manifold ways in which this virus propagates itself. It's been a very confounding experience. And people have seen in real time what it's like when science takes on a problem of a novel disease is never encountered before. We have about 15 minutes left in our conversation. While we're talking about public health officials, Dr. Fauci survived politically, even though he and President Trump were at odds many times throughout the year. Dr. Deborah Burks, who joined the Coronavirus Task Force, did not. Uh, You describe her in in making the decision to to come join the task force, wondering at that moment whether or not her career was going to be over. What happened in her case? Well, Deborah Burks was a U.S. AIDS ambassador, and she uh, had been uh, she had worked at the CDC previously. Uh, she was in South Africa when Matt Pottinger called and asked her uh, to to come head the uh, uh, coronavirus task force, or at least to be their their chief uh, of of staff. And um, Deborah Burks knew, having dealt with AIDS. Uh, that pandemics are incredibly political and uh, that it was going to be a highly controversial subject. And probably as the face of this uh, effort to stop uh, the pandemic, she was going to be criticized so roundly that it'd probably be the end of her career. And she was absolutely right about that. She... um, I was going to say, though, one part, I'm sure you're about to go there. One part of the story that you tell about her is that after she left public view, she got in her car and did a road trip. What was the purpose of it? Well, she realized she had lost influence in the Trump White House. And uh, you know, other people were whispering into the president's ear that th- such things as, you know, just let people get sick and then we'll get herd immunity. And um you know, this was so counter, uh, and she had no way to influence the president at that point. So she took to the road 
uh, with her chief epidemiologist, Ibram Saeed, and uh, they went all over the country. Uh, some states they visited multiple times, talking to governors, university presidents, uh, union leaders, and telling them exactly what they needed to do to combat the virus. And it was she was the only government official in the country doing this and it was it was interesting she would uh, sometimes chastise the governors uh, right in front of them in public about the you know the need to impose mass mandates to you know shut down saloons and bars and clubs where people were spreading the virus and and she was not entirely effective but broadly so a lot of minds were changed by that kind of personal encounter and this is despite the fact that, you know, she had become uh, reviled uh, by a lot of people because of uh, especially that scene where the president uh, talks about drinking bleach or putting sunlight inside your body. Uh, and you can see her eyes rolling, but she doesn't say anything uh, in a way. What could she have said at that point? But at that point, she became uh, a pinata for public criticism. We have just about 10 minutes left, and it is, as you said, a sweeping story. So let me uh, invite people to read the book and learn more about the stories that you tell and, and move into some, some broader observations. Uh, you um, tell the story of a country, the richest country in the world, with the world-class hospitals uh, that had done preparation for pandemics, and yet we ended up with the most number of cases, not per capita, but most in hard numbers, and the largest number of deaths, over 600,000. How... What did you learn about why we found ourselves in these circumstances? Well, you know, the figures you talk about, you know, being, us being number one. Uh, there was a global pandemic preparedness report that was prepared by Johns Hopkins and other entities. And it ranked the United States in, in number one in being prepared. And all the things that the president cited about, you know, the greatest public health institutions in the world, best scientists, they were true. And yet, if you had turned the rankings upside down, it would have been perhaps a more realistic uh, ex representation of what actually happened with countries like Rwanda, and Latvia, and Vietnam doing very well, and the U.S. and U.K., number one and number two, doing really poorly. Hubris had a lot to do with it. There's no question about it. Politics, uh, you know, the, in my opinion, every country in the world was going to be affected in a terrible, it was a terrible event and was bound to be. And tens of thousands of people were bound to die in the United States, but maybe not hundreds of thousands. And you can look around at the world at countries that did handle this well and, and imagine had we taken the same measures as they, uh, that you know the reduction in, in deaths would be extraordinary. Even inside our country, you can measure the difference in states. Uh, you know, there's Vermont and, and, and South Dakota, for instance, have a, you know, small states, but uh, Vermont uh, had, uh, both have Republican governors, but uh, Vermont took uh, far more cautions than South Dakota and had 12 times fewer deaths than the same size state. Uh, West Virginia is a, a really interesting example because the governor there, Jim Justice, who's a, a coal baron and a Republican, not the kind of person that you would normally associate uh, with, uh, you know, compassionate government. But when this disease first hit, he told his citizens, West Virginia is among the oldest and the sickest states in the union. And this disease is going to devastate us. And we have to do everything we can. And starting with, you know, testing the people in old folks' homes and making sure that they got vaccinations as soon as possible, he would go on the air in the evenings and talk about the people that died that day. He really made a difference. I'm not saying that West Virginia is, you know, superlative in the ranking of all the states. I mean, but it was supposed to be at the bottom, and it did about as well as Texas, for instance, a, a far wealthier, healthier, younger state. Uh, but And that's through the efforts of a Republican governor. Uh, 
had we had somebody uh, at a national level uh, concentrating that kind of interest, com competence and compassion, I, I think that our death toll would be far, far lower than it is in fact. You warn readers that COVID-19 is a harbinger of what's to come. Can yeah. you see whether or not lessons have been learned that will have this country and the world better prepared for the next round? I'm not sure. I, I'm i fascinated by the fact that, you know, when diseases come along like this, and 1918 is a good example, even the Black Plague in Italy in the 14th century, those events tend to get buried in history. I mean, you know, 1918, there was, you know, a war going on, uh, and the flu killed more, even more soldiers than the war did. Uh, estimated 50 to 100 million people worldwide. Uh, the average lifespan of an American dropped seven years uh, because of that disease. And yet, it was, it disappeared from history. Uh, so if, if history really takes note of this pandemic, then I think that we will we, we will see we will be seen as a kind of X-ray of our society, and we know now that we are not the country that was the most highly ranked in the world to handle this. We're a broken country, and I think the disease is a kind of X-ray that allows us to see all those fractures inside our society, and and it offers us the opportunity to mend them. But whether we take that opportunity or not, I think the, it's too early to tell. Wanted in our last five minutes together to inject a personal note f about you into our conversation. First of all, throughout this story, you do tell personal experiences. We learn about your scare with polio as a child. That uh, We also learn about friends of yours that contracted the disease and personal observations. Why did you decide to make this exercise also such a personal one? Well, there were a couple of reasons. One is that uh, I think that people care more about uh, a subject if they have if they meet people inside the discussion that they that they relate to. And so I've always tried in my writing to tell stories through the human experience. Rarely have I injected myself as a character, but I had so many. <laughs> It, just as a writing strategy at first, I had so many different characters that I, I felt that I needed some kind of unifying voice. It would be like tomato sauce and bring all the ingredients together. And that would have to be me. And once I started exploring that, it was interesting to realize, you know, that how disease has played a role in my life as it plays in everyone's lives. But, uh, you know, going back to that morning when I woke up and I couldn't move my legs, you know, uh, and that was possibly a reaction to a vaccination. Uh, that experience helped me understand the kind of anti-vax hysteria that is keeping people from uh, getting what is perhaps the safest vaccination that we could imagine. Uh, it's, it, I, I think that relating things personally keeps you honest with the reader. And that's at least what I was trying to achieve. Also noted that in the acknowledgement, you write that you're near the end of a long journalism career <clears throat> and allowed yourself a bit of a valedictory lap. Is this going to be your last book? Uh, no, Susan, you actually read that. Uh, I, you know, at the end of my books, I often like to write about the experience of writing the book and no this is i hope not the last book but i i'm old enough to realize that there's there's more road behind me than there is in front i love my career and one of the sad points as i approach the end, what will probably be near the end of my career is how journalism has fallen from fa favor and people distrust the press and yet i think it's it's one of the greatest careers that anybody can have. And, you know, I, I reflected on the fact that what are we other than our stories? And yet memories fade and people die. And, and the job of a journalist is to go around and collect those stories while they're still in people's minds and try to string them together together. 
in some kind of coherent narrative. And in that way, you, you preserve uh, these memories and make them, in a way, immortal. And, but it's a humble task. And uh, and yet at the same time, what a privilege to be given a person's story that is the most important thing that ever happened to them and trusted uh, to to handle it in a, in a caring manner. You know, it's to me, that's always been uh, a challenge and a great reward. The latest book by Lawrence Wright is The Plague Year. Uh, it is a first draft of history of the year 2020 in the United States and the arrival of the pandemic. Thank you very much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast, so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.